Thanks, Cheryl, and I can't wait to see the rest of that exciting interview. Welcome, everyone. I'm Fred Kaiser, and I'm your host here at the FA, uh, correction, the FAST Team National Resource Center, FA Production Studios, here at the Sun and Fun Complex at Lake in Florida. Another exciting presentation. It's going to be incredible about GPS, but our next presenter is a chief flight instructor for the AOPA Safety Foundation. He's a former Boeing 767 captain and Czech Airman for American Airlines. He's been an active CFI for more than 29 years, over 13,500 hours logged. He teaches regularly out of his home base at Frederick, Maryland. He has a 172 that he flies for pleasure and of course for business. And he's a regular on the speaking circuit, places like here, the AOPA uh, Expo, 99 groups, and he is a member of the Civil Air Patrol. His topic today is going to be the GPS from the ground up, and let's give a warm welcome to J.J. Greenway. Thank you very much, Fred. I've been coming to uh, Sun and Fun long enough to know that if you have the one o'clock speaking slot, there's going to be a little bit of competition. You'll hear the competition in a little bit. The building will shake, and uh, it'll sound like people are firing at us, and you'll hear uh, some very loud jet noises. So if we have to pause once in a while as we... Uh, as we get through this, then uh, we'll let some of the noise abate and then uh, continue on. Uh, GPS. I, I'm always looking for good GPS stories, and I had probably my best GPS story on, on my way here. Uh, I came down from Frederick, Maryland in, uh, the, in uh, AOPA's Bonanza with my boss, Bruce Landsberg, and uh, we had a good trip down, no problems. We landed at, uh, at the airport, and here we are. So. Uh, that's when the GPS fun began. We got in a rental car and, uh, and it had a GPS in it. Well, I'm pretty good with airplane GPS. I do a lot of that, but I don't do a lot of rental car GPS. I live in a small town and there's not a whole lot, a lot of need for a rental car GPS or a car GPS at all. So we started off from uh, Tampa, uh, Vandenberg, Tampa Executive Airport and started here. And uh, my boss, Bruce Lansbury, he said he didn't need no stinking GPS. So I started playing with it and I entered the hotel we were staying in, the Hilton Garden Hotel. And it said, uh, not found or doesn't exist. I forgot what it was. I thought that was kind of funny because they had everything in there. And Bruce said, well, he said, since you're on the H page, he said, try Hooters. So I enter Hooters in there and see what it says. So I entered Hooters in there and it says, nearest Hooters? Yes or no? <laughs> so I don't know if that was an advertising thing in that little Garmin uh, GPS or what it was. But uh, couldn't find the Hilton Garden Hotel, but it could find the nearest Hooters and wanted to know if we wanted to go there. So by hook or by crook, we found our way here with no GPS at all. Quick word for our uh, airport support network at the uh, at AOPA. We have any AOPA members in here? Oh, good. Okay, I guess you all stopped by the AOPA booth and saw that uh, nice Cirrus that you're going to win down there. More on that a little bit later. Uh, one of the things that your $39 a year gets you, uh, and as being AOPA members, uh, one of the things that we do is the airport support network is out there looking to protect your uh, rights to land and operate and use uh, any public use airport. What we try to do is we try to have volunteers uh, at each and every public use airport. We try to have people that can be our eyes and ears on the ground and if uh, a local town council or at the state level if an airport wants to be closed or in the case of Chicago, Mayor Daley wants to uh, take a bulldozer out and destroy the runway in the middle of the night, we try to be a little uh, more proactive on that rather than reactive and we try to have somebody there that can tell us what's going on that knows. So we're looking for volunteers and if uh, any of these airports that are within 150 miles of Lakeland here if any of these airports are near and dear to any of y'all here uh, and you want to uh, be one of our volunteers that uh, our eyes and ears on the ground, stop by our, uh, our booth. Um, I believe it was uh, at the AOPA tent, booth number eight. Um, and uh, talk to our people in the airport support network and uh, we'll see if we can get you signed up. Doesn't entail a lot other than just letting us know if you hear of a problem at a local airport. A couple of things, uh, if you're interested in obtaining WINGS credit, uh, a gentleman will be around with a clipboard and you can sign up with your name and email and we'll make sure that you get uh, WINGS credit for this course. 
And uh, if you're in the accident forgiveness program with uh, your insurance company, if they participate, and most of the big ones do, um, there's safety seminar registration cards in the back. If you just fill those out, uh, and we will take those at the end, and AOPA will send you either email or snail mail, we will send you a certificate of completion that you've attended this course, and your insurance company will recognize that for various purposes that they use for discounts and for accident forgiveness. A couple of things in the course as we're looking at some of the, uh, talking about the GPS, uh, VFR content and IFR content. Uh, instrument rated pilots in the room today, can I have a show of hands? Good, it's about 50%. That's usually about what we run. Um, I don't have an instrument rating, by the way. I had it taken away. Did you know that when you get your ATP license, they take away your instrument rating? I didn't realize that. I thought it was a mistake when I got my ATP license uh, 20 years ago or so. But uh, they take away your instrument rating. I guess they just assume that the airline transport pilot knows how to fly instruments. So it doesn't say instrument rated on my, on my license. <coughs> uh, so there are uh, IFR content and VFR content um, in some of these slides. Uh, don't get discouraged if some of the stuff, if you're a VFR only pilot, and some of the stuff is just a, a little bit on the high side. Um, we're going to touch briefly on it because it's kind of a quick moving course, but I'd, I'd like VFR pilots to try to take away one thing from this course. I'd like IFR pilots to try to wait, take away two things. And there's enough little nuggets in here uh, of things that you already knew but you just forgot that I'd like you to take away as, as we go through. I am not a uh, Garmin salesman. I'm not a uh, Bendix King or Honeywell salesman. I'm going to talk about some features of some particular units, but I'm really not dealing with specific units. Uh, I'm not dealing with uh, if we should twist the inner knob or the outer knob or exactly what the display should look like, but I'm trying to keep uh, in general terms um, just some of the useful tips and some of the things that we need to keep the big picture on as we're using uh, the GPS. Um, as it relates to the operations with ATC and as we look at the integration of GPS into our cockpits. What do we mean by integration? We'll talk about that a little bit more later uh, as far as is what we see, but we have so many things integrated in, even into the most simple handheld. And I realize that uh, it's hard to call something that costs $5,000 or $7,000 simple, but uh, some of these handhelds have some amazing capability that sprung up over in just the last couple of years. I was talking to the folks at the, uh, at the Garmin display about the uh, nice 696, and they advertise it as being uh, uh, small enough to fit on your knee board. You've got to have a pretty big knee if you're going to put that on your knee board, but a lot of capability in that, in that new unit. Not just navigation, but as we'll see, we have plenty of other uh, features on that uh, Garmin unit as well. Some of the uh, VFR panel mount units, and these are some of the early generation VFR panel mount units that you may be familiar with. No moving map displayed, but uh, just numbers. Um, take a look on that lower unit. Of course, I'll talk in a couple of minutes about latitude and longitude, but you remember when we used to have to deal with latitude and longitude rather than three-letter identifiers and four-letter identifiers. Moving up in uh, complexity and uh, actually moving up in dollar signs too. I got to thinking we probably should have put uh, rows of dollar signs as we, as we move up the ladder here. Some of the top of the line stuff, the Avidyne and the, uh, of course the G1000 that we're seeing in a lot of the airplanes today. Obviously very capable VFR machines, but uh, extremely capable IFR machines, uh, some of the things that we have out here. Getting back to the integration, um, Look at all the things we have. we have. We have one screen, and the whole point of GPS is for navigation, but look what we're piling onto that one navigation screen. Um, weather data link. Uh, we have uplink, XM, uh, weather, the capability on a lot of the units that we have. Uh, so on the same screen that we have the route overlay, we have the ability to display weather. The, uh, <clears throat> back in the mid-90s, uh, American Airlines had a real tragic accident down in Columbia, and on the approach into Cali, Columbia, in the Christmas season, a Boeing 757, the pilots lost their situational awareness even though they had very capable information in front of them and uh, hit terrain that was uh, at the 9400 foot level. Um, pretty much broadside at the top of a mountain. Well, how could two pilots, uh, very well trained pilots, with a bunch of information in front of them uh, using uh, navigation data that was even more accurate than GPS in some cases, run into a mountain uh, on a clear moonless night? Um, it was after that that the FAA took a real hard look at what we were doing with our navigation equipment and uh, some brilliant engineers came up with the idea of putting the terrain database for the world into navigation units and now even some of the simplest, I didn't say the cheapest, I said some of the simplest handheld units have terrain databases that are accurate 
uh, to within a couple of feet. Now, I say that they're accurate to within a couple of feet. We'll talk later about some accidents that have occurred, but uh, this is not terrain following radar that the United States military is using to keep us safe. This is uh, just terrain data to keep us from um, running into mountains uh, that we might not otherwise see. This is not something uh, so accurate we can uh, launch missiles with it, but uh, it's pretty good for keeping us safe and for keeping us from running into the terrain. Fuel management. Another thing that's displayed on our screens that we're normally used to navigating on and as we pile on the layers of integrated data, take a look, the, uh, this is just one display on the Garmin G1000. That dotted line ring would be the uh, extent of our range with fuel reserves and the utmost range on that solid line of how uh, far we're going to go until it gets really quiet and the engine stop or the engine stops. Fortunately on this one, it looks like we're going to be able to make it from Labrador all the way across the uh, cold part of the Atlantic to uh, Greenland. And it looks like there's a couple of airports within range in that Checklist. Uh, checklist management. Different uh, units, of course, different functions, but uh, the user modifiable checklist on some of the Garmin is a real nice feature if you want to modify your checklist. The Avidine, of course, has a factory checklist, and uh, rather than, uh, than being completely heads down with the checklist in your lap, not a good idea to do a checklist as you're moving in most cases, but at least with a checklist up on the panel in front of you, you stand a chance of having at least your head up and your eyes out the window more with uh, checklist data available uh, out in front of you. Once again, piling on the dollar signs of all the things that we can add to our screens, traffic displays uh, integrated into the GPS screen as well. Um, you see the yellow in the middle of the screen is, uh, is threat traffic. If it's uh, more threat traffic, most likely it's going to turn red. Most of the units are using a similar nomenclature. Multifunction display is where we have engine instrumentation uh, up on the same screen as we have navigation equipment. And, or na navigation information and as we have the uh, fuel uh, information as well. And then of course uh, the synthetic vision, kind of top of the line for general aviation now. It's been around in military and some airline applications for uh, a good 15 years now. But some of this is getting down into the realm of affordability for uh, uh, even some of the GA airplanes that we're flying, including as retrofit, uh, not just brand new purchase. The highway in the sky, if you look, uh, I'm pointing the cursor at the uh, the, the rectangular boxes, magenta rectangular boxes, that would uh, be indicative of the path that the airplane, the desired path of the airplane. And much like the video games that uh, people that are 40 years younger than me are better operating at than me, the airplane is simply flown up into those rectangular boxes, and that's the path that the airplane is supposed to be on. Very accurate way to steer an airplane for an approach, uh, not just for en route, but for an approach and, uh, and landing in some cases, all the way down to zero visibility. It's been tested. We, of course, don't have that, um, that option in GA yet. If you look right in the middle, right there where the cursor is, that, uh, that box is actually traffic from the traffic display. So the traffic shows up as, as a, a blip on the screen. So it's a true heads-down display as opposed to a heads-up display. Good if you're IMC or if you're in the clouds. Not so good if you're flying around on a VFR day heads-down. If we could have the volume from the control room, Let's take a quick look at uh, some of the things going on in ATC. Yeah, we're working in the radar room and this little airplane's flying around the city which is only five miles east of the airport. You can actually be close enough um, outside the Class Bravo but he potentially became into the Class Bravo and was just flying around the city. Now he's already violated the Class Bravo airspace but he's just flying we don't know what he's doing. He proceeds to fly to the approach end of the runway and proceeds to cross the first parallel, then cross the second parallel, then proceed on a downwind. Now, what you don't understand is that we're busy. So now every airplane that was on final is no longer on final. You know, everything's breaking loose. We don't know what this guy's doing. He proceeds to go to the city and he tools around a little bit more and he comes back to the airport. He flies up and down the runway. He called flight service and he says, I'm trying to get this to this particular airport. I'm slightly lost. And he says, well, show me the ground and tell me what you see out there and I can help you. The flight service guy recognized where he was and he said to follow the particular interstate and then turn left. This gentleman had his 11-year-old son with him in there and they had a GPS on board. He didn't recognize anything and it wasn't where he needed to be. He saw the airport and didn't know what he was supposed to be doing. So he calls flight service back and he says, listen, I'm still lost. I, I don't know where I am. I'm over this small little city and this small airport and I just don't know where I am. So the flight service guy says to him, 
well, what do you see? He says, well, I'm flying around the sea. I see a football stadium. And the flight service guy says, well, what does it say? He says, well, it says Ericsson. He goes, Ericsson? You're in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's a big airport. He goes, well, I, I didn't see any airplanes. And the reason he didn't see any airplanes is because we pulled them all off the final because he was flying all around our airport. So there wasn't anybody moving but him. We finally, the flight service guy gave him the frequency, told him to call Charlotte. And we made him land, and we talked to him big time. So his son was working the GPS and didn't quite know how to work it. That's how come they got lost. Anne Marie has a tendency to understate. Uh, looking into the case a little bit more, he was had a little more punishment than being talked to big time. I think he was uh, relieved of his pilot's license for a uh, uh, um, couple of months or so after that. Um, kind of agree, kind of funny, but his 11-year-old kid was running the GPS, uh, but pretty egregious, uh, flying over a pretty busy airport uh, that's in the top 15 busiest airports in the nation um, with a piece of navigation on equipment aboard, equipment aboard that was capable of navigating him to an area as big as his, as small as his airplane, yet he is so lost he doesn't know even know what state he's in. There was just a navigation incursion, I believe it was the day before yesterday, up in Washington, D.C., where we live. And of course, when uh, we have a navigation incursion up in Washington, D.C., over the White House, it always makes world news. But there was yet another one just a couple of days ago, and uh, there was GPS on board, but uh, uh, how someone got so far off just a couple of days ago with this equipment on board and with all the warnings uh, that have been out there from other people done it, have done it, it's beyond me, but it's still happening. And that's what I want to talk about in this course. Like I say, I, I don't want to drill down into the nuts and bolts. I want to try to keep the big picture because there's some really good stuff out here for sale on the grounds and we're getting some better and better stuff in our airplanes, but um, we're still uh, making some pretty egregious mistakes. Uh, number one, and number two, the safety record in, in general aviation for all the improvement we've had and the devices we've had um, that are designed to improve safety, our safety record has remained pretty constant. And that's one thing that worries me a little bit is that we're spending a lot of money on equipment that's not necessarily making us safer. I know the equipment has the capability of making us safer, I just think that I need to learn a little bit more about how to use it to make us safer. Let's jump into handhelds, and I know that a lot of us do use handhelds, and uh, I'm still using an old Garmin 195 from uh, a couple presidential administrations ago. Is anyone using the 195? Kind of shaped like a brick? About as heavy as a brick? Good, I'm not the only one. Y'all still getting updates for that from, from Garmin? Yeah, so-so. I haven't, <coughs> haven't updated mine for a while. We'll talk about that. But uh, it's tough to get updates on some of the older ones. These are some of the newer uh, VFR handhelds and some of the capability of it. The uh, 396, 496, of course, is a popular one, and it's uh, got a lot of information uh, available on it. Of course, you pay more if you're going to get traffic uh, input to it with a subscription. Um, the 696, like I mentioned earlier, very capable unit. And uh, the old Bendix King, which Honeywell is making now, is, uh, is still on the market. It's available even with uh, synthetic vision with, uh, with an additional plug-in. Some of the early panel mounts up at the top there, as you see, uh, GPS units, basically not uh, integrated glass cockpits, but yet boxes that we slide into the avionics stack. Some of the capability of those, uh, they're WAS equipped, unlike the GPS, uh, the handheld GPS. We have uh, the panel mounts that are WAS equipped. We'll talk more about that later. All of them are capable of getting traffic, and uh, the WAS equipped ones are, of course, approved for sole source of navigation. Moving into the, the uh, integrated panel or the glass panel with the GPS, the G1000, of course, the, the Garmin 600, and some of the uh, more sophisticated inter integrated panels. Is it the same thing as sliding boxes in? Not really the same thing. Um, you'll notice on, on the G1000 or the Avidyne units, if you're not getting a GPS signal, you essentially have blank screens other than engine information. So you need to have that GPS input uh, on an integrated cockpit if you have all glass screens in the cockpit. Capability of those, of course, is, uh, is they're all very capable units, um, all the way down to the uh, Cirrus Perspective on the G1000 that even has a uh, blue button in the middle that if you get in trouble, you can press it and it levels the wings and uh, is designed to get you out of a bad situation if you get yourself into one. So um, I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later. Some of the early generation GPS, and I know that uh, I'm not the only one here that's been flying for more than 15 years, but we've been using GPS for about that long for VFR and IFR operations. But just, just to show how far we've come, anyone fly out of uh, this area, this airport? Could someone tell me the northerly latitude of this general area? Anybody? 
northerly latitude. We're not, uh, we're not the equator. We're not 45 degrees north. Anybody want to venture a guess? 27, 28, 30? Okay. reason why you know that is back in the old days, we used to have to deal with latitude and longitude. And uh, all those things, uh, for those of us who have been, been entering latitude and longitude into some of these machines for a while, um, we have these uh, little bits of information stuck in our head about latitude and longitude, so we tend to know the latitude of, of the cities we fly to, or longitude, or at least generally. Uh, I still remember San Juan, Puerto Rico is 18265-66002, and Seattle Boeing Field is 4732-12218, so I don't need to know those anymore. At one time, maybe I did, but now, uh, on these newer units, we are simply entering um, waypoint names. So, Kilo Lima Alpha Lima for Lakeland, Florida, and uh, Kilo uh, Mike India Alpha for Miami, Florida. So we really only need to know the three-letter identifiers, not the entire string of digits for latitude and longitude. Great thing for uh, decreasing the workload in the cockpit, decreasing the amount of time that we're spending entering things into the machine. 430 and 530, of course, uh, the Garmin, fairly typical of what uh, a lot of uh, most of people are flying with right now. Small screens maybe, but pretty good display of data. Move up to the G1000, of course, and, uh, and, and nice big screens. Um, I, I had the opportunity to go through, uh, I asked for a show of hands on, on who's going to win that new Cirrus, or who's an AOPA member, so you all are, have the opportunity to win that new Cirrus. Uh, so earlier in February, I, I went and got Cirrus factory training so I could deliver it to you and give you your 10 hours of training for the insurance company. So uh, for an old guy like me that's been flying for a while, I really appreciated that uh, horizon that's almost a foot across that you can see. Really hard to miss that uh, all the way a foot across in front of you there. I really appreciated that display uh, in the new Cirrus. So great display of data. Um, tough to miss if you got all brown on that screen and your nose is way down or if you have all blue on that screen and your nose is way up. You'd have to be really vision impaired to not see, see that. Cirrus perspective, of course, uh, and I mentioned the, uh, the easy button there in the middle of the panel. And uh, some good stuff out there. Of course, standby instruments. First thing I like to do is that when I get in the cockpit is look for something familiar. And of course, when I got in that cockpit, these three were the only real familiar ones. I knew what those were. But uh, in a matter of a week, uh, the training came, uh, it wasn't easy, but the uh, training came to me pretty well. The uh, synthetic vision, like I mentioned earlier, is even available on some of the smaller handheld units. Basically, all it's done is it's taken the world terrain database, plugged it into the positional base, and sort of fleshed out a picture of what the terrain's like below you. It's not like infrared radar that's actually looking at it, but it's just a pretty good representation of the terrain that's down there. Quick view on the Cirrus perspective. Watch, it's just a view of the cockpit, and then it's a view of the cockpit in flight. Kind of neat to see some of the things that are available. Like I said, uh, this is informally referred to as not a heads-up display, but a heads-down display. Nice programming capability. And uh, take a look as, and this is looking, not out the window, but this is looking at the navigation screen with a synthetic vision. Of course, the sea level, or the blue, is the water. And we move on to land, and higher terrain elevation in a lighter color until we get darker color. And then we have terrain that's a threat. And you can see we're getting a pull-up indication right here, visually, for terrain that's a threat. Turns red, and when the threat is mitigated, or the airplane's turned away, it's uh, not quite so uh, prominent. Terrain turns to yellow. As we're back in, uh, in danger zone, we get red terrain. So this takes uh, some pretty uh, benign flying and, and makes it all the easier to see where the threat is. Now we're headed right down the final approach on about a three degree glide slope toward the runway. You can see the runway uh, coming up on us right there. We're flying the uh, synthetic vision, the highway in the sky right down the slot, and as we approach the runway, we can see the center line of the runway. This is all generated synthetically. Wow, I hardly ever touched down on the center line like that. So uh, good, good display. Uh, pop quiz as we go along here, just to make sure everyone's on their toes. When do you need current GPS data? Anybody want to answer that one? When you get an FAA ramp inspection? No? That's probably not a bad idea to have it, but when do you need it? There are times... Uh, well, you should always have it. I, and coming from the Air Safety Foundation, I wouldn't recommend that you run around without current GPS data. But uh, you actually can fly, and you can fly IFR in some certain cases without having an up-to-date database. En route IFR, uh, there's a provision made that if you check the uh, position or check the uh, coordinates uh, and make sure the intersections have not been moved, completely legal. Approach IFR, we start getting into some areas where you do need to have a current database. 
So something to look in the uh, aeronautical information manual about the circumstances under which you do need current data for the GPS and you're allowed to operate without it. It's uh, a lot of the uh, Air Safety Foundation programs that we put on. We look for accidents that have happened. We try to find disturbing trends and we try to make a safety seminar that will correct those. Not a lot of accidents that have happened from people misusing GPS. A lot of people getting lost. A lot of people uh, getting violated in the case of the people that flew over the White House the other day. But uh, we looked in the uh, Aviation Safety Reporting System, ASRS, that NASA runs uh, for the FAA. And we looked at uh, not accidents that happened, but incidents that happened that could have become accidents. And we dug into them and, and got some of the information because these are things that could, maybe you're not going to fly over the White House like these guys did, but some of these mistakes, tell me if you could have made them. Uh, the, the user in this one used the direct to the waypoint. The database was one cycle out of date. That's 28 days, less than 28 days out of date. The waypoint name didn't change, but the location did. So he sure enough navigated to the point, but the point wasn't where he thought the point was. And uh, nothing happened. He reported himself. He didn't get in trouble. He received vectors to a new location and landed without incident. But his comment was a current database would have avoided that happening. Let's jump in the airplane, or at least go out on the, uh, the flight line, and uh, just look at some of the practical gotchas uh, when we're using the GPS, some of the problem areas that we've uncovered in the Air Safety Foundation where people are having problems. And uh, interspersed along the way, we'll look at some of the safety reports that have come in of people that have confessed that the problems they've had, and hopefully these can be learning moments for all of us. In the pre-flight, not that the pre-flight briefing isn't long enough as it is, but there's a couple more things you're going to want to check, the uh, GPS and WAS notams. You dig through there and there's some really interesting things. Um, I saw one the other day, it said uh, GPS unreliable within a one nautical mile of, and it gave a point, uh, up to 7,000 feet. So right in that area, it's kind of like that black cloud that follows Dennis the Menace around, right in that area there's uh, no, no GPS signals. I don't know what's happening to them. I sometimes like to speculate, but sometimes the government likes to block uh, GPS areas in certain, uh, GPS signals in certain areas um, just to do a test to see if that capability exists. Um, it happens on a wider scale area, of course up in the DC area we see that once in a while. But that's always put out by NOTAM. Uh, the Department of Defense rarely just shuts down GPS signals that I know of um, just for fun. So they usually put out a NOTAM in advance and you know if you're going to have unreliable signals. Minimum altitudes. Another thing to check, the whole point of a GPS is to get us out there going direct. That's why we spend all the money on a GPS. We don't need to fly point to point. We don't need to follow roads. Uh, we don't need to fly VOR to VOR, but we're going to go direct. But the one thing that following roads, following VORs gives us is terrain clearance that is pretty benign and terrain clearance that we know about. Going direct, you're going to want to check um, obstructions and terrain. Make sure you have enough clearance. Airspace is another good one, too. Not just the real prominent airspace uh, that everybody knows about, uh, TFRs or presidential TFRs during the election, there's lots of those. But uh, one of the gotchas is uh, the sports TFRs, stadium TFRs. Those things tend to come up uh, and go away with not a lot of fanfare. If a game goes overtime, sometimes even the controllers don't know if the TFR is still active and they have to ask. But uh, do recall that uh, one of the uh, things that the Department of Homeland Security has given us is um, is TFRs or temporary flight restrictions over large gatherings of uh, people uh, assembled for uh, in sports complexes. Of course, we have Disneyland under the same thing too. So uh, FAA's best source for this, the Internet Flight Planner, uh, AOPA's Internet Flight Planner is really good. FlightAware.com has uh, some good information on these uh, last minute TFRs that pop up. Entering the route and the waypoints. Unless you have one of the more sophisticated units where you can enter a, uh, an airway the number of the airway, the jet airway or the Victor airway, think about what you're loading into the GPS. On a typical installation on a 430 Garmin or a 530 Garmin, you're entering the VOR and then you have an airway and it leads to another VOR. If you simply enter one VOR and the other VOR, you've just connected those two VORs. Is that a straight line between them? Chances are it's not a completely straight line. I know that's the easy thing to do is just enter that, those two anchoring points on that airway but you need to enter a few intersections if you're actually going to accurately fly that. Particularly important for IFR. The controller has you in radar contact most likely and those few intersections in between, there might be just a couple of degrees of variation, uh, magnetic variation or declination between those VORs so you may not get as accurate a routing if you're just anchoring the route VOR to VOR. Double check that. The uh, ICAO 
identifier or the four-letter identifier versus the three-letter identifier. The FAA is trying to get away from this, and it's been most successful in the last decade or so, but we still have uh, a disturbing number of airports around the country that have the same name as the VOR. Portland, Oregon VOR used to sit up on a hill, and it was PDX. The Portland airport was down on the river, and it was also PDX or KPDX. And there have been dozens of people that have flown to the VOR and uh, before they renamed it, have flown to the VOR and uh, realized that they were nowhere near the airport. We have that even in Florida. There's uh, about a half dozen uh, VORs and airports that are not co-located but do have the same identifier with the exception of the K in front. Something to double check if you're not familiar with a particular area. One uh, ASRS report that came in was the pilot admitted that uh, he had not entered the K in front of the three-letter identifier, didn't realize his mistake, and actually busted Cincinnati's Class B airspace on this. Uh, filing the report and confessing his predicament actually uh, saved him from getting a violation on this, but that's the reason why the FAA has this program, is so pilots can, uh, can tell on themselves and hopefully the rest of us can learn from the mistakes that some other people have made with this. As far as filing direct is concerned, did you really check these things prior to getting into the airplane? Minimum altitudes, terrain, and airspace. Before you, trek, before you press that direct button, uh, that's something to take a look at. Walk around the ramp uh, at most airports and take a look in the cockpit at most GPSs. And uh, there's paint is kind of worn off one button on most units, and it's usually that direct button. Pilots are using that a lot. Uh, it's the easiest thing to use in there. But the ability to load a flight plan is, cap is a capability of virtually all of these GPSs. Not a bad idea to make sure that you know how to load one. Uh, for IFR flying, the departure procedures, the RNAV departure procedures, and the RNAV uh, standard terminal arrivals, the STARS, these must be in the database, and it must be a current database. These are not things that can be manually entered, and that's uh, in the FAA order. And we can't use it if it's not in the database. This doesn't affect most of us, but uh, last June, uh, if we are filing a flight plan using RNAV arrivals and RNAV departures, the ICAO, or the International Flight Plan, is required. For those of us that are not using RNAV arrivals and departures, we're still using the same old flight plan that's near and dear to all of us that we've been using for uh, coming up on four decades. Um, the airlines have all switched to the International Flight Plan because the airlines are, are virtually all of them are using the IFR arrivals and IFR departures. One thing that uh, is confusing, and I guarantee I can unconfuse it for you real quick as far as the uh, GPS is concerned, is the RAIM or the Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. The um, signals from the satellite are not always good, and the geometry that the, Seattle, that the satellites are in are, is not always favorable, particularly in northerly latitudes. The satellite geometry, or where you're hitting them or your receiver is hitting them, is not always good if they're low on the horizon or if there's very few satellites. Your GPS, your non-WAS equipped GPS can predict when you get to your destination if you're going to have good signal geometry or if the satellites are going to be able to provide good enough data for you to navigate with. So you can predict your RAIM, uh, either your unit can predict it for you or you can go, there's a RAIM prediction website, RAIMprediction.net, uh, government website, where you can say when you're going to be at a certain place and it will tell you if you're going to have a good navigation signal. Now, WAS equipped GPS, who has a WAS equipped GPS? A couple people in here, good. I do not have a WAS equipped GPS. I occasionally fly our uh, airplane at AOPA that has one. The WAS equipped GPS, the reason why you spend all that extra money is it kind of does that for you. The WAS equipped GPS is smart enough that it knows if it's not getting good geometry, if it knows if it's not going to be getting good geometry, knows that it's not going to be getting good signal capability, and it just says, no thanks, I'm not going to do it, and it tells you that, or it selects different signals. So think of the RAIM for a non-WAS as a manual thing. Think of all that extra money you spent for your WAS-equipped unit, and that is an automatic thing, and it does it for you. I am aware that some of the, uh, some of the Garmin units, uh, before they went WAS-converted, still have the uh, capability of the page in there to compute RAIM, even though they're WAS-equipped, but it's not something that we're using uh, with WAS-equipped airplanes. What happens when you lose everything? Uh, your plan B. If you're VFR, obviously your plan B is made out of plexiglass and it's uh, right in front of you. It's your window and you can look out your window and use it. Um, plan B, if you're IFR, um, do you still have the capability to get VFR? Do you have your charts or to get VOR reception? Do you have your charts with you or do you know the VOR frequencies that you can tune to? 
something to think of because GPS is not uh, like any other source of navigation is not 100% reliable, although we like to think it is uh, in all parts of the world. Taxiing. We did the pre-flight. Time, uh, time to get the engine running and, and start taxiing. Good idea to get as much as you uh, need to do done before you start the engine. Get the clearance done, particularly if you're a single pilot and you can't hang some of the duties on, uh, on other people in the cockpit. Um, get the clearance before you start the engine and uh, try to load up as much as you can with the GPS uh, before you start the engine too. That's how the airlines do it. That's why uh, things look pretty busy up in the cockpit before you leave the gate. The pilots are up there. They're not loading uh, GPS or getting clearance on the taxi out. That's all happen happening uh, at the gate where it's quiet and the airplane's not moving and there's no distractions. All that happens before the airplane moves and then the airplane pushes back and taxis. Um, FAA is real big on this right now, and rightly so, but runway incursions. Uh, there's an FAA Office of Runway Safety at headquarters in Washington, D.C. that's uh, very heavily staffed, and it's a good thing because uh, not only are uh, airliners running into each other on, or running onto runways when they don't mean to, but uh, in general aviation, we kind of have a, a dismal record of doing that, too. Um, up in Pennsylvania la uh, last year, there was a, a lawn mowing crew that uh, ran a lawn mower right out onto the runway in front of an airplane as well. So, the FAA is really big on this runway incursion thing, and all the distractions in the cockpit now that we have with, um, with, with the items that are available um, worries me a little bit that we have more things, to, more reason to be heads down when we really need to be heads up. Nice feature on, uh, on a lot of the units, particularly the panel mounts, is the minute you touch down, the screen automatically display, displays an airport taxi diagram. Um, very nice, particularly an unfamiliar airport, to be able to look at the taxi diagram. And it might as well have one of those things that has on the map out here in front of the building that says, you are here, because there is your airplane on that taxiway. Real temptation to look down and spend a lot of time looking down at that. But uh, once again, you have traffic out there that is your immediate priority. Real good uh, way to not get lost, though. And uh, we highly recommend that you have that page up, at least, when you're taxiing, if you have that capability. Uh, in addition to having a paper chart out that has a good taxiway diagram on it. One report that came in was uh, at a non-towered field. The uh, Cessna had just landed and uh, the pilot actually spotted uh, a Bonanza taxiing onto the runway and uh, someone got on the Unicom that happened to be watching and yelled, stop! And the Bonanza did stop, but uh, in the ensuing investigation he, realized, he admitted that he was uh, programming his GPS and thought he was stopped and his feet had slipped off the brakes a little bit. Fortunately, he didn't hit anything, but uh, came real close and the GPS was admittedly a distraction in this. Let's jump into the departure phase of flight. And I know that that, uh, that moving map that you paid so much for that uh, occupies so much real estate on your panel is real easy for your eyes to be drawn to it. And it's got that magenta line. But do recall, part of what you paid for with your installation is the CDI, or the Course Deviation Indicator, needle. Pictured here is the older style uh, rectilinear movement, um, uh, non-digital. Uh, of course, the digital display of a needle is a, a legal representation as well. But in virtually all installations, uh, for IFR, GPS navigation is not legal without that installed CDI, or the Course Deviation Indicator. So it's in the airplane. It's usually not as easy to look at or as prominently displayed as that nice moving map is, but bear in mind the moving map is uh, virtually f most all the time for reference. The actual course guidance information comes from the moving or from the uh, course deviation indicator needle. On departure, I know it seems like the controllers just do this for a test sometimes, but how many times have you gotten your route all loaded up, everything's fine, and on departure uh, they say uh, fly heading. Uh, 240 cleared direct Walla Walla when able. So you don't even have Walla Walla in there and you don't even know that the three letter identifier for Walla Walla is ALW. And you are uh, thinking that you're really not impressing that controller at all. Ask from ATC for vectors. ATC didn't do this do a test for a test. They didn't do it to make you look foolish in front of your instrument flight instructor or in front of your husband or in front of your wife. Ask ATC for a vector. Say. Uh, hey, I don't have that uh, loaded in yet. How about a vector uh, until I get it loaded in? ATC is happy to provide it in, I, I would say, 99 out of 100% uh, of the time, and um, I, maybe 100% of the time. Uh, ATC is not there to give you tests. They're not there to confuse you. But just ask for a vector 
uh, if they clear you direct somewhere that's not in your flight plan. Real easy to do and the safest thing to do. Pop quiz again. Is GPS approved for a sole source of navigation? Anybody using it for a sole source of navigation? Well, VFR it is, right? How about IFR? WAS, did I hear somebody say WAS? Yeah, IFR installations that are WAS uh, approved are, equi are used for sole source of navigation. Otherwise, if it's non-WAS, then we have VOR backups. If you start reading that FAA order really carefully, it doesn't say that the VOR has to be operational, but it does say that you have to have a backup. So um, just playing by the rules here. Jumping into the en route phase of flight. Um, make sure you know how to edit waypoints. That's not always intuitive uh, on these GPS units. And if you have learned to do it, it may take you a while doing it on the ground. But in flight, when you're moving at a couple miles a minute, not a bad idea to make sure uh, that you know how to edit a route. Because uh, particularly in the East Coast here, I've rarely flown IFR in the last couple of years that I haven't had an amendment to my route or edit to my route required. And I'll be the first to tell you that uh, on some of the GPS units I fly, I am very rusty if I ever even knew at all how to edit some of these routes. So it's not something that we uh, do a lot of in training, but it's something we do a lot of in real life. Not a bad idea if you have a choice, uh, autopilot for single pilot IFR. Really good idea. Of course, the autopilot is uh, not human. Um, it'll only do what you tell it. And if you tell it to do the wrong thing, it will quite happily do the wrong thing and not even know it's doing the wrong thing. So um, with another pilot in the cockpit, um, just so I can share the blame a little bit if something goes wrong, I kind of like to say uh, when I'm programming the GPS, I like to take the autopilot off the GPS steering mode, maybe put it in the heading mode, and then make the change to the routing, and then say to the other pilot, how does that look to you? That way, if it's wrong, you can say, hey, you told me to do it. But at least you're getting two people, and at least you're getting a verification uh, of what you have entered into the GPS. Is it right before your autopilot uh, blindly starts following uh, what you put into the GPS? Just to double check. Another couple things that are popping up that uh, we haven't seen until uh, GPS started getting a little more prolific is uh, the T-routes. Those actually started in the United States down in, uh, in southern Florida, and you've probably got more down here than we do up in, uh, up in the mid-Atlantic seaboard. Um, nothing real special, but it, it is an RNAV IFR, so it's a, it's a WASC-capable IFR terminal transition route. No big deals. It's uh, just like an airway. It's marked on the map, though, with a T in a, in a blue uh, box, terminal routes. En route, we have uh, a couple of different types of waypoints. We don't see these so much en route. I've only, I was looking on a chart out west, and it took me about three or four states before I could find them on an en route chart. We do have the fly over versus fly by RNAV waypoints on approach charts. Quite frequently, we have, actually most of the time, we have both of them on approach charts. When we get to the approach section here, in just a couple of minutes, uh, we will look in, in, at the difference between those. Everybody pay their taxes on April 15th? Good. I don't want to be uh, having anyone have their airplane repossessed. Uh, we complain about paying taxes. I got to tell you, the government gives us some good things back once in a while. Let me tell you one thing that they're giving us back little by little. They're giving us back more airspace. More airspace, you say. The government's taking away airspace. How are they giving us more airspace? Look at this. If you have a uh, GPS that you can navigate with legally IFR, think about the MEAs. Now, I know we're in Florida, and your MEAs, your minimum in route, in route altitudes, are about 1,500 feet or 2,000 feet. They're not very much around here. Um, back where I come from out in the Mountain West, not uncommon to have MEAs of 12, 14, and 16,000 feet. And I don't know about what you all are flying, but my Cessna 172 that was made when I was in fifth grade has never been above 14,000 feet and probably wouldn't get above 14,000 feet. So me flying out west when I have my next speaking engagement out in Alaska is probably not going to work in my Cessna 172. However, the government's doing something good. They are saying that these MEAs, what's an MEA predicated on? We have a VOR here and a VOR here, and we have a real high MEA. Why do we have a high MEA? Instrument pilots? Reception, Reception of the VOR. Obstruction. Obstructions. I'll take those two. There's a couple other ones, but that's fine. We have reception and obstructions. Well, reception is not a factor, because I paid $7,500, and I have this nice GPS installed in there. So I don't need VOR reception. I could be on the ground underneath that MEA and get really, really, really good reception. So what they're doing is they're lowering the MEAs for those of you or those of us that are using GPS. That's a good thing. So they're giving us back some airspace. 
Um, this is, sounds kind of nerdy, but I get kind of excited about this because I, I do a lot of flying out west. So every 56 days when the en route charts are revised, I like to look on there. And I'll tell you, about a dozen airways uh, per revision cycle are getting revised. So we're getting something good back for that tax money you paid on April 15th. So it's good. Hopefully on, in the Mountain West we'll get a lot of these things down so that uh, even those of us that uh, fly airplanes that don't go very high are going to be able to get across the Rocky Mountains uh, in, in good, good shape. Nearest button. Most of the units have this. Um, really good. Not just nearest airports. That's what we usually use it for, but we can get uh, nav aids, um, ATC frequencies. I used this the other day when I was getting training in that, uh, that Cirrus that I'm going to deliver to you when you win it. And uh, I wasn't really lost. I was just temporarily unsure of my position. And uh, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to ask the, the flight service station to get the weather for where I was going, so I punched nearest flight service station, and it came up with uh, a frequency, and I only tell this story to illustrate that not everything that comes out of that box is completely right. The frequency for the nearest flight service station, it said 122.1. Does that set off an alarm bell in anybody's head? Anything wrong with 122.1? Anyone want to talk about it? I got it. Receive only. It didn't tell me, though, what uh, I was supposed to listen on. So uh, there was some good information, but it wasn't complete information that came out of that GPS box. So uh, somewhere dimly in the 30 plus years it's been since I was in private pilot school, I remembered that 122.1 probably wasn't going to work, so uh, just use 121.5 instead. No, didn't do that. Okay. Uh, but no matter what we're doing, VFR or IFR, we still have, uh, especially IFR too, when we think that we have positive protection from, with ATC, we still need to be looking outside. Do you have to carry paper charts if you have charts on your GPS? Unless you have a very expensive paperless cockpit, and it's usually not in most of the airplanes we fly that have a single source of electricity, uh, so the, uh, if the screens go blank, you have no information. But there are paperless cockpits. There are installations approved. Um, most of them are in the larger airplanes that cost in the seven figures, not in the six figures. But it is working its way down to general aviation. There are a few uh, fairly common GA types that have installations like this. It's good stuff, but unless you have it, you still need to carry paper charts. Jumping into the arrival, the types of approaches. Um, just in the last year, this is another good thing your government's given you. Um, <clears throat> seem to be all about good government. I don't know, I woke up in a good mood this morning. Um, I've been out of Washington, D.C. for a while, maybe that's it. Um, we now, just in the last year, have the LPV, or the localizer performance with vertical navigation, vertical capability. We have LPV minimums on GPS approaches that equal ILS Category 1 minimums. Um, just flew my first one about a month ago up in State College, Pennsylvania. We recently got one right uh, around the corner from where I live in Hagerstown, Maryland. 200 foot decision altitude and half mile visibility and that's with no ground reference, no ground stations at all. That's not an ILS, that's not a localizer, that's not a glide slope, that's GPS only. Of course you still need to have lights on the ground, runway markings and things like that, but uh, the capability is rapidly improving on this. There's getting to be more and more uh, of the LPV approaches. It's opening up a lot of airports for IFR traffic that never had IFR traffic. The localizer performance, uh, just like a localizer only, and of course the LNAV and VNAV that we've always had. Just to look at the differences in, in the capabilities of some of these different approaches for IFR pilots, uh, decision altitudes on the LPV, of course, like I said, now all the way down to 200 feet. Um, LNAV, VNAV, this isn't 100% correct, it says WAS required. A lot of the uh, airline installations and business jet installations have altimeters that are sensitive enough so they do not need WAS capability for that. Another thing just to be aware of on your specific unit is, is when to load or activate. And the reason why I've thrown this in here is because it does vary from unit to unit. On some of the Garmin's uh, you can activate approach an approach not having loaded it and it will be just fine. Others you have to first load the approach and then activate the approach. And also uh, another thing too that I find myself making a big mistake on is what source of navigation are you using? Are you using VOR or are you using GPS? It's real easy to switch on and off but I'm a little disturbed by the fact that a lot of airplanes, uh, the installation doesn't have a real clear enunciation in front of you, a button that says you are using VOR or you are using GPS. Mode awareness, be sure you know exactly what mode you're operating in. Sounds funny, but we're not allowed to create our own approaches. Why would you want to make your own approach, you say? 
Um, we have a lot of private airports around, and I know people are doing this, but the FAA kind of frowns on uh, people making up their own approaches to their own airports. Um, the FAA is really good about making up an approach to your airport. Like everything else in the government, it takes a long time, but uh, I'm working right now on getting a new approach to, uh, to our airport up in Frederick, Maryland there, and uh, it's been about a year and a half, and we actually have a date in October where they said we're going to have a new approach. So it will take about two years, but we will have a legal approach, and it's not going to cost us any money. I, I guess it cost me those taxes I paid, but uh, we're not going to have to pay for it uh, up front. So um, if you need an approach to an airport, a private airport, or even the airport you fly out of, they do take requests. Got to have a good reason for it, though. Um, auto sequencing versus hold, and this is another one too uh, that varies. This is one of the functions that varies a lot from unit to unit. Uh, if you're going to hold, you need to press the hold button when you get there, or if you don't press that hold button, what's going to happen? Is the airplane going to not know that you're holding and it's going to go ahead and sequence forward to the next fix? Usually if you don't press that hold button prior to getting there, usually you do have to revert to a manual mode because the airplane had no idea that you just received a holding clearance. You notice these pop quiz questions? The answers to most of them have been, it depends <laughs> on one thing or another. Uh, on this one. this one, this one the answer is not it depends. Can you use a handheld GPS in, IR, in uh, IFR conditions on the instrument flight plan? I got some no's, I got any yeses? Yes. Yes, okay, I got some no's and yeses. Hear me out on this one. Tell me if, tell me if I'm too, uh, too far out of bounds. I hope I'm not. But uh, I'm not using it for sole source and navigation. I'm not using it to get somewhere with. But let's say I don't have an IFR GPS on board and I have a handheld GPS. There is nothing stopping me from taking off out of here like I'm going to do tomorrow morning with a handheld GPS on board. And my first fix is going to be Florence, South Carolina. There's nothing stopping me from saying to the controller, hey, uh, it looks like about a 010 heading for Florence, uh, South Carolina. How does that look to you, sir? And he'll say, fine, fly heading 010 until receiving Florence, South Carolina, clear direct. Lawyers would call that leading the witness. Uh, all that is doing is just um, suggesting to the controller an idea. The controller looks at it, he agrees with you. He doesn't tell you to use your handheld GPS. He simply gives you a vector or gives you a heading and you fly that vector. So really good for situational awareness. I highly recommend if you have a handheld GPS, you do use it for IFR flight, but just not use it for your sole source of navigation. Very good way to keep yourself uh, situationally aware. WAS, really all it is, and this is something we just enjoy, not just in the United States, but only in the lower 48. Not too many people in the world have WAS. There's some other iterations that other countries are coming up with. I won't say it's real simple, but the whole concept of it is easily explainable. We have the GPS signals coming at us from the GPS satellite uh, constellation that's up there. It gets to the ground, and it has some error in it. Granted, it doesn't have very much error in it. But what the WASP system does, all it does is there's about two dozen stations across the United States from coast to coast, pretty evenly spaced out, and there is a master station on the left coast and a master station on the right, right coast, and they take all the signal errors that have been gathered across the country and send a signal up to the one satellite, and then that satellite sends a signal back down to your WAS unit that you paid extra for, so all those free signals that all the regular people are using, you get now a special signal that's your WAS signal. It takes out the correction, and it gives you something that's highly accurate. Let's see how highly accurate it is. Take a look at VOR navigation. Look at the circle around this airplane that's uh, flying, as it's flying. And it doesn't want to do that. But um, anyway, the, cir the circle for VOR navigation is much larger than the wingspan of the airplane. For GPS, it comes down, just regular GPS, it comes down to about the circle around the wingspan of the airplane. And for WAS, it's something just about the size of that pointer in the middle of the airplane. So we have av navigation accuracy all the way down to just a couple of feet with the WAS signal. Quick memory jogger, just remember what, what it is when we're talking about these different approaches. And there is these four new types of approaches that you've been flying IFR for decades with only three types of approaches. Now we all of a sudden got four more piled on. If it has a V in it, like LPV or vertical navigation, that's a WAS approach, and that has vertical guidance associated with it. One gotcha on this that's getting a lot of people is uh, you still have a non-precision approach, but you have a vertical guidance on it, just like you did on an ILS for you instrument pilots. When you get to the end of that, uh, your, your decision altitude, decision height, and you've been following vertical guidance all the way down, 
you are not permitted to level out and fly just like on a non-precision approach. It's not a dive and drive. It's a do the approach and miss when you get there if you don't see anything. So looks like an ILS, feels like an ILS, smells like an ILS, but it's not. Uh, it's, it's still a non-precision approach. Just looking at the, at the types of uh, uh, navigational accuracy that are required for this, you hear the term uh, RNP, or Required Navigational Performance. In route, it's two miles or five miles, depending on which branch of a couple different FAA offices we've asked. We've gone with the most conservative, two miles. Terminal, we need one mile of accuracy, and of course on an approach, we need the most accuracy, so we're all the way up to uh, three-tenths of a mile. GPS approaches have actually made life quite a bit easier. We have uh, the basic T shape, and virtually all the GPS uh, approaches are like this. We talked about the fly-by waypoints versus the fly-over waypoints. Notice the difference in this waypoint, this waypoint, the final approach point, and then the missed approach is a fly-over. These are fly-by waypoints, and you can see why. We have a 90-degree turn to make here, and if we made a 90-degree turn after we crossed the fix, we would sh overshoot. So we make the turn lead the fix, and roll out on the final approach course. Of course, if we do go miss, we do have to do a fly over. Just like any other approach, we can request vectors to final, or we can request own navigation onto the final approach. We talked before about holding and sequencing. Generally, most of the GPS units, your active route is the magenta line. So if your active route including a, included a holding fix, that holding pattern better be uh, colored in the color of your next route or magenta in most cases otherwise you're not going to be getting good information procedure turns or not this is a time when we do a procedure turn not to get caught up in too much button pushing uh, because there's too much going on uh, at that phase of the approach almost as much as going on uh, in the missed approach phase of the flight and this is where we've identified a lot of accidents particularly recently in some very capable GPS equipped airplanes. There's a lot to do in a missed approach anyway. There's even more to do in a missed approach with GPS if you're trying to keep it going. Good time not to get bogged down in the intricacies when you're near the ground, you can't see anything, uh, and it's not a good time to be wrapped up in trying to um, uh, fly the airplane and monitor the GPS and program the GPS. Just uh, a quick recap, what if you do screw up the approach? It's no different with GPS. We've all, uh, instrument pilots, uh, made some mistakes and had to get vectored off an approach for another try. Same thing with GPS. Ask the controller for a vector back on to the approach, start the approach again, do it all over again. But whatever you do, like I say, there's some incredible capability out there, but it's not improving our safety records. So focus on flying the airplane first, of course, and make sure you know what to do to get yourself out of a situation. Most of these GPSs, if you press a button, press it again, and it's the wrong button, press it again, it'll take you back to where you were. Make sure you know which is your, uh, which is your uh, get out of jail free button for the GPS unit that you're operating in. A good instructor that knows it is invaluable for teaching you how to use it. Manage the whole flight, and it's just like everything else, fly the airplane first, have another plan if something goes wrong. Appreciate y'all coming out and having uh, visiting the uh, AOPA Air Safety Foundation Safety Seminar. Fly safe out there and uh, use your GPS for what it was designed for. Thank you very much. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Thank you. Thank you, friend. JJ. Don't go too far away. We'll just be cutting up here to the roof in just a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes. But uh, thanks again, folks. We really do appreciate your participation, and we will be. Oh, we will be. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks again for your participation. And what we're going to be doing now is going live up to the roof here for uh, our continuing coverage of Sun and Fun. Thank you all. Have a great day. Good job. You know, I can see why so many people are just.